Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners, loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this show and just tell me what they do and let me record how this decade affects us. Please do donate any amount you can to the Working Hours Project through PayPal or consider sustaining Working Hours with a regular £1 a month or more subscription on Patreon.com. Addresses for support are in the outro. This is intended as an expansive and expensive long-term project which I want to make available to anyone and I can only do that with your help. So if you can, please help. What did you want to be when you grew up? Growing up, when I was extremely uh, young, uh, I was always in the classic young boy's mindset. I just wanted to be a footballer and a group, to be honest. Same as any young lad. But um, that kind of died a death at the age of about 16. When I kind of, it kind of got to the stage where it was like, well, you've got to kind of either take stuff seriously now. It's like, uh, or you're going to either end up nowhere or a footballer, which is very unlikely. So I, um, realistically, that's when kind of my goals changed in that mm-hmm. kind of aspect. And uh, I looked towards, honestly, I, I looked towards the, the medical route because at the time we'd had a few um like my grandpa had been quite ill, so we'd spent a lot of time in and around hospitals. My mum was always mm. keen for that to be a route that, that I went down. Um, mm. And so I kind of just didn't really think about anything other than that, to be honest, for a couple of years. Mm. It was really, it, it was a, a college where that changed. But yeah, that was probably what I wanted to be when I grew up. I'd say a footballer. And then uh, when I became more realistic, um, a doctor at school or something in the medical region. Mm. So when you were sort of, briefly flirting with the idea of doing medicine Mm -hmm. um were you had you had any careers advice or anything were you looking to get like did you need to have good grades is that what you were after at the time yeah so so it was at the time so i'd I'd done i'd I'd done i'd achieved quite high grades in my gcse results so um obviously that opened up that kind of idea Mm -hmm. um so i was kind of looking at it as like at that time it was kind of one of the only things which you looked at and you kind of knew was a well-respected I- ideal. So I was like, it stuck out for me. So, but it was then when I went on to my A-levels. So I just, uh, I ended up picking A-levels to do with that. And then I did work experience at my GCSE level, mm. doing uh, stuff in like doctor's surgery, just little stuff like that. And then when I went on to A-level, I even went as far as that. I wrote a personal statement at one point for, for a medical degree. Um, and I did work experience in the Leeds A&E department with, um, uh, one of my family friends who was working there at the time. And so, yes, yeah, so I did, I did I quite, I went quite heavily into it. I even did, um, I don't know if you're uh, wet and if you heard of it, but there's a, there's an MCAT assessment or an, uh, something like that, like a, a CAS, an MCAT assessment, which mm-hmm. you have to do. It's just kind of like a, it's kind of like a IQ test kind of thing like slash like non-verbal verbal reasoning Mm. exam which um, is required for a lot of universities to do a medical degree Mm -hmm. um you have to have a certain score on that so i had to go over to york to some special assessment center and pay uh, pay to do one of those so um yeah i did go quite far on with it it was kind of really late on in my college experience where I kind of decided that that might not be the ideal route for me anymore. And maybe I'd kind of just not really open my eyes to anything else. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, you, it's, it's hard, isn't it? You, you can't know every job and you're only ever exposed to so many sort of roles and only a certain percentage of those you're kind of like, 
Well, those I could do, those I'm not going to do. It always yeah, seems smaller than it is, yeah. You're listening to Series 4, Episode 4, and to my guest, Benji Morton. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 19th of January, 2023. Hey up. Benji Morton is a software developer by day and an aspiring events organiser by night. Benji is 23, was born in Leeds, and is yet to live anywhere else. Benji joined NHS Digital as an apprentice developer at age 18 and worked and studied throughout the pandemic. In 2022, Benji started both Leeds Dates and Sunday Sessions events and has found a love for the events scene, something he is keen to pursue going forward. To find out more about Leeds Dates, go to instagram.com forward slash LDS, that's Lima Delta Sierra underscore dates. And to find out more about Sunday Sessions events, go to instagram.com forward slash Sunday Sessions events. Follow, listen, share, guest, donate to podcasts you like. Loiners, get your ass on this show and then get your friends and neighbours on it too. Join me on Patreon or Ko-fi or throw me a donation. Show your support on social with likes, follows and shares. I can't make this show popular. Only you can do that. Share and recommend working hours wherever and whenever you can. Right, let's do this. Episode 84 of Working Hours with Benji Morton. What is it that you're doing now then? So now I'm doing something which, to be honest, if you'd have spoken to me before I actually started it, I would never have expected to have gone into what I ended up doing. So I started straight after college. Uh, I went into software development, so I started on a degree apprenticeship program Mm -hmm. with NHS Digital to eventually qualify to be a full-blown software developer. And um, that was kind of like a, at the time, it was like a four-year deal, four-year, five-year deal. So that's been what I've done for the last four years and three, four years, four months. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, I'm... A fully qualified software developer but when i started obviously um i came in 2018 so september 2018 mm-hmm. and came on as a digital degree apprentice as my was my official title but um essentially just a trainee apprentice software developer with not much knowledge of the field at all to be honest mm. how did you get into it so essentially when i was leaving college and i kind of realized that i didn't know what I wanted to do with myself categorically. I made a decision that I didn't want to go to university Mm. and then potentially end up with a monumental loan Mm. to train up to do something which I might not end up wanting to do in the end. So I just looked at other avenues and realistically, I'd also, I'd all, I always wanted to kind of earn a bit of money as well so I could kind of move out and get up get on with get on with stuff so I want but I wanted to kind of get a degree so I looked at the degree apprenticeships and this one kind of stuck out and so that's kind of how I got into it to be honest I kind of just I applied for a few and then I, I went along with this one the most it was close to home and ideal and it sounded interesting and I'd also I'd always liked the idea of problem solving I kind of like I liked maths and yeah. I thought problem solving maybe we'll do some it problem solving um maybe i was slightly naive as it's uh, extremely difficult in it problem solving but but yeah i do enjoy it so i think it was a good good choice so when you were doing the apprenticeship i know some apprenticeships it's like you have to you know you like apply for the apprenticeship and then you have to find the role the vacancy and so on did you have to do all of that or was it was that kind of set up for you for the actual apprenticeship i heard of it I heard about the apprenticeship through family. So um, a member of the family actually worked for the organization and knew that I was at the time struggling to find and work out what I was wanting to do. And I was looking at apprenticeships and they'd know that this was the first year they'd ever done an apprenticeship. So it was like big news at the organization. So he just kind of like mentioned it because it wasn't really advertised anywhere at, mm-hmm. um, at the time when I when I kind of heard about it. And I was like, that could be something that I looked into. So I kind of like had it in the back of my mind. 
Mm. And then, yeah, when I saw it eventually advertised later on, that's when it kind of like stuck out to me because I'd obviously heard about it before that. Mm. So I just, uh, yeah, I applied at that point. Mm. And um, yeah, so, I mean, from the medical, initial medical path, I mean, you've, it was NHS digital that you ended up at. So was that in any way deliberate as well? Was that kind of, well, this is meshing the two worlds together? Slightly. So like it's, there's, there's a lot of talk about this in, in the field, but it, mm. it's, but I, at, at that age, I honestly, I didn't, I hadn't, no, is the honest answer. I hadn't <laughs> really, I hadn't really like, I wasn't bothered. I liked the idea of it being something that was having a positive effect, you know, so I mean, having, having a good impact. Mm. So it, it feels morally good to do the work, you know, mm. I mean, there's no, there's no negative moral implications. So it, it felt in that sense, it felt good, but, mm. um, honestly at the time I didn't even think about it. It was, um, just a, this looks good, um, mm. kind of thing. And I wasn't really, and like I say, it was one that stuck out. I wasn't looking in, I wasn't out there looking for software development apprenticeship. So I kind of didn't mm. compare it to anything else. So it didn't really have to stand out from a crowd. It was kind of more like which job do I want to do rather than which company do I want to go for? Uh, so I'm going to start off with COVID. What I want you to kind of think about here is uh, think about going into lockdown initially and where you were work-wise was that, you know, whether that was a big drop off in work or whether it was a huge acceleration in work, was it, I mean, was it a lot of sitting around? Did you end up doing more and more work? And what are the kind of things that like, now, how has COVID changed your work? What what do you see as the impacts being of how how work's changed for you now? COVID massively impacted my my job and mm. uh, every, every every different aspect of it. To be honest, it was mm. well when we went into COVID. At the time, I was working five days a week in the office in a fairly large team working on a what I thought to be a fairly important project. Yeah. When COVID happened, kind of, there was that day where it kind of like we snapped and we had to all be at home. Mm. And so that day was like a, a really pivotal moment. Like my, my career completely changed. Like the, the, my working life like literally completely flipped on its head. And the next day we were working from home and I didn't know on that day that three years later, I would still be working from home with, mm. and realistically have gone into the office. I, I have the option to go in more often than I do, but I have probably gone in for less than the equivalent of a week in the last three years. Yeah. So, um, oh, well, uh, however long, I think it's knocking on three years if it's not already mm. been, I think mm. it is in a couple of months. So yeah, from that aspect, it massively changed. We, we went straight to working from home and that has been the case ever since and since since that sorry i'm struggling to organize my thoughts and there's right. just a lot of a lot of grounds to cover on this topic to be honest from, from my work's point of view but um then yes yeah, so we it kind of we've adapted into now we have teams with members of the team who simply like we wouldn't be able to do a five day working week in the office because we have people working who are based all over the place now, all the, uh, from all the way down in Exeter to all the way up in Scotland. Do you know what I mean? So we yeah. can't have a five day working week in Leeds anymore and that'll just never happen. Yeah. And, um, so there's the option there for the people who work in and live in Leeds to go into an office, mm. which is compulsory, uh, not compulsory is, um, it's non-compulsory to, to attend. So therefore it's, it, it's kind of software development. It's one of those jobs where it's like you, the benefits you get as a developer from going into the office is you get, you've got the people working around you who you can, for me anyway, who you can get assistance from if you need it, or you can, mm. you can talk to and stuff like that. And it makes those communication pathways much easier. Um, mm. as you can simply just walk over to someone and start a mm. conversation rather than having to uh, wait for a reply on a message or wait for an email mm. and stuff like that. Or put, you didn't know that you didn't have to necessarily put smaller things in people's diaries. You could just go over and chat to them about it. So, but now 
the, there's no need. Uh, if I went into the office, then there it could, there's highly unlikely that there'll be four or five developers on my team in the office. In fact, I know for a fact, there's probably not going to be any, or may, or on a good day, there might be one other person. So it's, it's just simply not worth it. You know what I mean? It's not worth the parking. Mm. So it's like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. Um, I'd, uh, so I st- that's why I've stayed at home. And mm. so that's massively changed. So it's, there's now no longer the working in the office aspect of it, but I'm mm. sure that's not, that's not universal, but, um, especially for my organization, I think mm. it's probably, uh, potentially like a, it's just, a, this is saving an office space at the end of the day, isn't it? We used to have mm. an office in Bridgewater place, an office in, um, Whitehall, the old, all down Wellington street. Mm. And um, now it's so three or four offices. And just now we are over two floors of one building now, I think. So we've yeah. massively cut that down. Um, yeah. So that's this. I think that the stats was it. Even if we ever were to go back into working in the office, there's only enough room for 20% of the office of the working force to be in the office on a day. So yeah. you could only go in one day a week if we were all being fed. You know what I mean? If we made everyone go in. Mm. So, yeah, so that changed. And then work-wise, the workload, obviously, initially, the next day, it was kind of like a, there, was a, there was a transitional period where kind of work being done was a priority, but more a finding how we were going to adapt to working like this was more of a priority. It was more like, how can we put processes in place mm. to replace the processes which we used to use, which we might not be able to use anymore. Mm. And that was kind of more of a priority than getting the work over the line initially. And this I'm talking very early initial stages, like first two weeks is obviously working in NHS digital. After that point, there was much higher priorities as there was obviously with COVID, Mm. COVID, a new thing, Mm. COVID, a new piece of data and Mm. That's what NHS Digital is essentially there to handle is Mm -hmm. our patient data up and down the country. So a new piece of data, which is essentially the now most important piece of data, people are tracking it. It's on the news every day. Mm -hmm. And um, who people want to know how many people died and people want to know how many people have got it. They want to know where and they want to know who's got it. They want to know that they're staying inside. Mm. And this is all essentially... NHS data, which is required to provide all these statistics and all of these, all of these functionalities. So therefore, after that point, I think initially it will have been much higher up above me, uh, but discussions will have been taking place as to, right, what do we have to do now? And I don't think anybody knew really very quickly, but when it was w- worked out, we quickly realized that we were going to, uh, that we were going to need to do quite a lot. So mm. then work rate picked up quite, ma- quite, uh, yeah, quite impressively to be honest. So, um, mm. we had new projects coming up all over the place and like quite a lot of people were kind of, you would, you would stop what you were doing and we were, this was like, this was new priority mm. and that was just expected to be honest. We, we all knew that that there was going to be a lot of changes about what was, about what was being priorities to work on. So yeah, that all sorts of stuff came through. So, I mean, I don't know how much detail you'd want me to go into, but we had like, obviously the track and trace, all mm. the, all that kind of stuff. So that the track and trace app that was developed through NHS digital, obviously. And that, and that again, uh, and, and I'm not going to say it's perfect i know it's massively widely criticized for certain things but also massively praised but i i think it, it was it, it, anything like that is incredibly difficult at those times when it's it's being people want it they want it quickly and mm. but nobody knows exactly what they want and um and that's always been a thing in software development it's like getting a clear set of requirements and providing to that criteria and mm. when that's never changing and uh, you've got new variants and all things like this, and it's all day by day. It's it's not it's not changing over the course of a year. Yeah, it's changing almost over the course of a minute. And then people want they almost want that on the news by six pm that night. Uh, mm. So do you know what I mean? People want to know straight away because 
the, with the way it is these days. Like the people are talking about it before it's on the news. So it's like mm. you need to, you kind of need to be as up to date as you possibly can. Mm. So yeah, in in that sense, work massively picked up, um, and there was loads of work to be done on um, everybody who who needed to who got the NHS app for the like track and trace. It was. And I remember there was a facial recognition step where everybody had to send up a, a, a picture of themselves. Well, that verification had to be done for every single person who, who, um, who applied for, who, who got an account. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a, again, massive amounts of work, which is required to be done by somebody. Mm. So that was all, all there as well. So yeah, there was just, there was work coming out all over the place and there was not enough people to do it, but it was handled on the whole incredibly well. And yeah, my, my personal life got busy for a certain period of time. Mm. And then over the course of COVID essentially it slowed down as that happened. Mm. And now we're in a stage where we've come out of the back end of COVID and if anything, my workload is now it's slightly more than it was when I was in the office, mm -hmm. but my time is, I have a lot more time than I did when I was in the office. Mm -hmm. So all of the like little things that you would do in the office, little presentations that would be going on mm -hmm. in the kitchen for 45 minutes that you go and watch, they're no longer on, uh, from home. So I go to the essential meetings and anything other than that, I kind of prioritize my work over that. So. I get more work done, but I have much more free time. So mm. and I'd say my workload has probably stayed essentially the same. Mm. Yeah, because I like I'll often go into kind of work life balance and stuff. But I think with with you, it'd be interesting to sort of look at. I mean, as an apprentice, well, first of all, there's the 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 element of I, I guess for you, there was never any fear of like, oh, well, I might not have a job or I might be furloughed. It would be like oh hell we've got way more to do now um yeah. so yeah so there's there's that side but i think for your apprenticeship i mean like do you think it was a benefit to have that experience to have something that was so big and to kind of go through that process while you're doing that kind of qualification or would it have been much better just to kind of finish off and then maybe deal with something like that when you're more secure in the role um, so yeah, my, with the apprenticeship side of things, it was, it was difficult, um, I'd say because, well, up until that point, I'd kind of had a day a week, 20% of my job time, which was assigned to my apprenticeship, my, to my degree. So I'd mm -hmm. kind of had one day a week where I'd worked from home and I'd done that. So, and then at that point it carried on that way. I had one day a week where I was doing my university stuff, but my university time was now once a week was a, a four hour lecture mm. uh, online, mm. which without questions and stuff like that, it was kind of like a four hour lecture online, uh, once a week. And that was different to how that had been before where we'd had in person and we kind of done two workshops over the course of every module where we'd gone to a specific city. Mm. And we'd gone to a QA quality apprenticeships office and done a two day workshop Then we do two, two day workshops over the course of every module. Mm -hmm. And we go somewhere and we do these two days and we do them in person with class of about 20 and we learn the, the content. And so in that sense, university kind of, it felt like it was now, it felt like I'm just doing an online degree. You know what I mean? And I kind of mm -hmm. didn't really feel like. I had a, I don't have a place to go like you mm. before I kind of had, I didn't really have QA to go to, but I went there. I went somewhere physically, mm. uh, it's like 10 times a year, 15 times a year. Mm. And so it felt like I was a part of more than an online course. Whereas that kind of changed when COVID hit, where it, it's, you felt a bit more like I have a tutor who I, I have like a, a, a mentor, I'd say. Mm. Uh, I've just finished my degree at this point. Like mm. now I've kind of just handed everything in now, mm. uh, four years and three years, three months later or something like that, but kind of just finished him. But, um, yeah, we kind of just had a mentor for a point of contact after the COVID hit that I can't complain. They were very good at, at anything 
the university was very mm. good with COVID kind of stuff and they, they did provide good um, alternatives and thorough material and they adapted their assessments. To be honest, that we, we, we didn't have assessments after COVID hit. No, We've just, yeah. it's been entirely well, um, assignment based. Yeah. So it's in, in that sense, it made it a lot, a lot better. Cause it's yeah. like, you can spend time when you're at home, you can, you can do that. So there was nothing else to do a lot of the time in COVID. So it was a lot better really in that sense for the actual work done, but for the inter interactive side of it, mm. that kind of went down. Yeah. If I think about myself in that situation, you know, sort of being halfway through a degree and then you kind of lose the, the teaching side, but then the job sides become very real and very busy. Like, I mean, there was a, I, for me personally, I would feel that there's a danger of me kind of forgetting the degree at that point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, first of all, congratulations for getting to the end <laughs> and finishing it, getting it all in. Um, but I mean, was that, was that a factor or was it, did you kind of think, well, I don't need to do this part because I'm, you know, I'm doing the job now or was it always a consideration because it's like, well, I've, you know, I've come this far, I may as well get the degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I completely get you. I, I, I think it was, well, at the start, it, when the workload picked up, I was kind of just into like kind of the middle of my second year and mm. I was kind of in the swing of things and it kind of felt like second nature. I kind of adapted to kind of keep my degree to the kind of time periods that I worked in it. Mm. And so I didn't really let that affect it really so it that was the i didn't feel like my job prevented me from being able to work on my degree because mm. my job workload picked up a lot but my they don't i'm not expected to do anything outside of my kind of working hours mm. you know what i mean i work from home mm. i turn my laptop off at the end of my seven and a half hours of the day and that's kind of, I to kind of have all, I've done that since I started working from home because in my eyes, I, I, you, there is, you can do more, but in my job it is, it, it doesn't get noticed unless you're in an office. So, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. people don't know if that took you four hours or if it took you 40 minutes. So it's mm -hmm. like, if you're in an office and they see you there till seven o'clock at night instead of five, mm -hmm. then you feel a certain like you'd done something for a reason if you'd done that. But if I, if I, if I stayed on till seven every night, I'd just be, the only person who'd be winning is NHS Digital as a whole. And, and, um, I value my time slightly more than that. So I would try to turn off kind of at the end of the day and then do my degree. I've got enough to do, do you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, yeah. That side of things. Um, yeah, I, I think, and that's a, that's a certain point, to be honest, with the working from home thing is like, it does to a certain extent for this job, it's like, you don't feel as noticed, do you know what I mean, as seen, because yeah. it's yeah, like, yeah. you, you can, kind of do become a very much a moving part in a big machine, and mm. it's not always as connected as, as it is, like, I have my team, but the last time I really spoke to anybody outside of my immediate team at work is... A very long time and mm -hmm. whereas that felt a lot a lot more connected in the office because you'd be making a cup of tea next to somebody who was in another team you'd yeah, be having your yeah. lunch with somebody who was on the team and you'd have presentations in the kitchen at uh, lunchtime every day from teams on other floors from doing other other stuff entirely and they all felt a lot more connected and where and whereas now that it, it's almost and i don't know if this is just me but it's so it's kind of feels like it's adapting into what it's like a I'm sure those things are still going on somewhere, mm. but I don't want to have to go and find them. I like just stumbling across them in the kitchen at lunchtime. I didn't want to have to know that that was going on and come down yeah. from the floor. I like, you know what I mean? Like if yeah. it's there, you'll do it. You don't want to have to feel like you have to go out of your way. So. No, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. It's, it's like, well, I have to make that effort to go and find that information out, but you know, I don't have to. Yeah, no, yeah, you know, exactly. It's like, it's when you stumble across it, it's kind of like, oh, it's here. Oh, that's quite interesting. Now I know yeah. something else. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. As well with something like NHS Digital, I mean, I suppose you were immediately, I, I don't know how much people were working from at home, but I would imagine by then, at that point, everyone would have some capability 
to be able to do it, you know, there would be some expectation of, or you might work at home one day or so on. So that when you had to make that move, it wasn't like, oh God, now we've got to get everyone laptops and make sure they've got connection and, you know, probably for some people, but. No, so that actually, uh, to a certain extent, so everybody kind of has a laptop that's kind of expected, like you, we, you, you, you're provided with a laptop and stuff like that. But to the extent of being, we, everybody was required to, there was VPNs, for example, yeah. that everybody needed to be provided with. And there was a, like a big documentation of everybody getting connected onto the VPN and uh, helping everybody on board onto that. And, and stuff like that. And obviously then we've got, we've got live service teams, which have to obviously be in the office. So if you do go into the office any day of the week, there will always be your live service there and your service desk and people like that, because they are working on stuff, which they kind of have to be there. So, mm -hmm. so you will always have some people in there and you will, and there is that nowadays, there's quite a lot of people who do go into the offices. So you now kind of, you do just go in and you see quite a busy office. Yeah, because um, it's a lovely place to work, it, but it, it's obviously now it's it's just an option. So it's if you have that option there on your doorstep and you want to go into work, and it's mm. not too difficult for you to do so, then it's almost like a be your guest, be, be be my guest kind of situation. Come in if you want to. It's like a library almost. You know what mm. I mean? Like you can go in and work in it. Um, uh, and co-working uh, space. Yeah, <laughs> and kind of like, but yeah, exactly, exactly. And certain people, I'm sure there's. In, there's a, important people having important meetings in, in, in there at certain times. Mm. Um, but from my level, I, it's uh, more of like, a, for the developers, it's kind of like, if you want to go and work there, there's, there's some nice desks. Mm. You can go and work there if you want to. There might be some people from your area to speak to. Mm. But it's not by, by no means required. And to a certain extent, by no means really that beneficial do you know what i mean it kind yeah, of yeah. You know, there's no i don't get any benefits from going into the office yeah other than a free coffee essentially do you know what i mean it's um yeah it's more of a kind of i work from home i'm comfortable i can mm. get hold of everybody just as easily as i could if i was in the office so yeah i'd say we're almost fully adapted to kind of everybody can work from home mm. but we have it as an option mm. When you first moved to working from home, was it just sitting on the end of the bed or did you have a dedicated space? Could you, did you have that separation between work and your own time? Initially I didn't, initially I was living in a studio flat in the center of town. So I kind of ate and slept and chilled out and worked all in the same space. So it was initially quite stressful to be honest, mm. but that kind of drove my move out of out of that flat so i moved out of there pretty quickly as after covid to be honest as i also didn't want to be locked down in in my flat on my own so um i moved in with a friend who lived quite close so i had i moved into a house at that point mm. but obviously i didn't have all of the equipment at home for to work from home as efficiently as i had in the office you know i had two screens up in yeah. front of me a nice keyboard mouse pad all that stuff nice desk yeah um yeah. i had i kind of just had the laptop and um so it was like i had a desk obviously mm. but not one that i'd kind of see myself functionally working at seven yeah. so like five days a week sitting yeah. there for 35 hours so i didn't really i didn't have a setup no i'd say that kind of came with time work work funded a lot of that we got mm. i got about 400 quid over the course of change period into working from home mm. provided by work mm, as for office should. equipment yeah 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 so we got um i got yeah so i've got i've got a nice setup now but um that that's been two two years in the making you know what i mean yeah, so, yeah. yeah it's not um it wasn't an over the night overnight thing and i didn't have that prior to us moving into covid that this covid definitely drove it yeah. I don't think I'd have this right now if I was going into the office every day because I wouldn't want to see a desk when I got home. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, now I do have like a separate office room with my desk and everything like that. But at the, at the start of COVID, I had my desk kind of at the end of my bed. Uh, so it was, it was very different. Mm. Are you still on the laptop screen or have they given you a bigger screen as well now? No, so when so you kind of got your choice of what you wanted to spend this money on, do you know what I mean? Mm, like you yeah, got, yeah. so I went into the office actually to get a chair because obviously since we were going, since the office was shut, yeah. we had all the used office chairs and there were 
and they were nothing to do with them. So I went yeah. in and they, they were letting people borrow them. So I went in and took a took an office chair. Um, I don't know if they remembered that, but I've still got an office chair. So um <laughs> three years later, that's still my office chair. So um yeah, I went there, I went in, took an office chair, and then I Obviously, the first time around, I got a couple of hundred quid. I think I bought a, I think I bought that first monitor with that. Mm-hmm. So I bought a monitor just to go behind my laptop because I'd always been used to working on two monitors. I'd never really worked mm-hmm. off a laptop screen. And mm-hmm. to be honest, when I moved down, when I moved into lockdown, my keyboard on my laptop uh, hadn't wasn't even working at the time. I'd been I'd been using a plug-in laptop because I'd spilled coffee on it about three weeks before I went into lockdown. And I just I just thought, oh, I can't we can't be sorting this out now and use the plug-in keyboard. Mm. So, um, yeah, when I went into lockdown, I was like, kind of like, I can't use a laptop and the keyboard doesn't even work on it. So I was like, I need to get this sorted out. So yeah, then they kind of got my, got my screens and, um, one by one, I kind of got everything that I needed. Has Brexit changed your work at all? Like, have you noticed any change in how you work or how work is done since we have Brexited? No, not to, to be honest, I don't, I don't, I can't see any direct impact that brexit has had mm. well probably my organization as a whole it probably it almost definitely did have an impact probably mm. somewhere down the line not anywhere i have any knowledge of mm. but um my working day honestly was not you still there <laughs> all right come cool. i thought yeah, i lost sorry. you for a minute then um, uh, no well that was kind of what i expected to be honest the uh, like from my point of view the only thing i could potentially think of is kit because i worked uh somewhere where we were buying it equipment and most of that was coming from sort of stores in europe and things like that so that's the only thing i could potentially think of but you um, know you're you're not necessarily going to see that because you're not yeah no i mean for, yeah essentially from from my no, I don't. I honestly, can't, I can't think. Of, I'm sure. Yeah, NHS wide, mm. obviously, massively impacted because mm. of all like uh, pharmaceutical on the whole, everything. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's all your supplies. Impacted. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, on that from that side of things, the NHS as a whole massively mm. impacted. But my personal job, it doesn't require resource in that in that sense. Do you know what I mean? So mm. and um. No, I, don't, I can't. I honestly, can't. I'd be lying if I said I could think of anything that that it that it impacted other than potentially the cost of my lunch. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, that's that's why I ask in a in a kind of work setting because you know if you ask someone about Brexit, most people are going to go. Their go to will be you know I've picked this team or that team, and I'm going to go with this, and this is my opinion on it. But I think when you bring it down to like, what's it actually affected in your job? it it makes the question different and to be honest i haven't heard i've only heard either negative or nothing i haven't heard a yeah. good answer yet no one said no it's amazing huh. i'm sure someone will at some point yeah maybe maybe one day yeah you <laughs> <laughs> let me know <laughs> yeah i think i'll make it a feature of the, the episode <laughs> someone said something good about Britain. <laughs> so we'll do uh we'll do climate change next and then i'll do social media Question again is basically how it's affecting your work. So again, with this question, I expected there to be a lot more people who are kind of, it's not a concern. I don't believe in it, but everyone so far has, you know, responded in a kind of, yes, it's, it's something that's on my radar. NHS digital, I imagine will have green policies and so on. But the question is, uh, how does climate change affect your work? Like, are there any changes adaptations mitigations awareness raising is there anything that you do in your job or can do in your job in regards to adapting to climate change well i think yeah it's a big part it is a big part of the nature's digital it's kind of one of our kind of goals is Mm. to be a lot more environmentally sustainable and like kind of minded in 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 our day-to-day work but uh, on the whole, as an organization, it's also, um, it's kind of like more of like, um, so like, for example, I'll get, I'll just give examples. And so we aim to go, I think it's paperless by like 2024 yeah. or something like that. So like completely paperless as an organization, because obviously we work a lot online 
Mm. Well, obviously when you, we were in the office, then this massively helped probably with COVID, but I don't know how much of this people do at home, but mm. I can't imagine now because it's not required because we work from home. So there's no, I can't imagine people are printing anywhere near as much as they were when we were in the office. Yeah. Uh, we, I used to print stuff off in the office and I haven't printed since I worked from home because mm. I don't, I don't need to, I, mm. I, don't, I never feel the need to print something off. So mm. I, I don't. And the organization doesn't as a whole, everything's sent over by email in, in that aspect, we've gone paperless. So that's a start or one thing I can definitely think about. Um, but other than that, we, I mean, from a data standpoint, we, mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at moving our data into, and this is me kind of freestyling to be missed on kind mm -hmm. of what I know of climate change mm -hmm. and what I know of on this topic and kind of seeing what I can relate in my work in my workspace which isn't kind of talked about as being stuff but i can i'm sure that moving data to the cloud which is what we're doing mm. in a lot of our teams at the moment so uh, and my team especially so moving data to the cloud on on like a very basic level is essentially we're not going to have two copies of all of our memory sticks that are holding mm -hmm all of this data to do with the patients in the UK, instead mm -hmm. of doing that, we're going to rent this space off mm -hmm. of whoever this provider of this cloud is to so say Amazon, AWS, if Amazon provide the cloud, Amazon have servers all over the place. They mm -hmm. will let, lend you some space and provide you with a lovely tool that is AWS and a console with loads of features, which you can do stuff with your data very easily. And so they'll kind of give you their space. And so previously, obviously, if you're somebody who holds data and you could be required at any moment in time to need access to all of that data at once, or you might, and on servers and stuff like that, you were required to kind of have at all times enough to, but it's kind of like, it less, and if you make the analogy, go deeper into an analogy, but if you like say, a workshop on a daily basis wouldn't always need all of its workers, but it would need maximum on Christmas day. So it's like, mm -hmm. you've always got to have as many as you would need on Christmas day, just there, just in case a day like Christmas day comes along yep. and you've got to have two copies of that just in case the day like Christmas day comes along and then somebody blows up that workshop. So you got to have another one just in yeah. case that happens. So that's kind of the thing with data because you, you need to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Yeah. So it's like, and having all of that, is extremely ex well it's expensive it's not it's not friendly for the environment you you've got all of this stuff which is it's obviously using electricity all the time mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to be um so it's like moving then to the cloud is what what we're saying is right well amazon they have to have an incredible amount of servers in order to in order to to say like everybody ordered a parcel from amazon on the same day Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that Amazon got to a point where they're like, look, we've got all these servers, thousands and thousands and thousands of them, and we ever, only ever use a couple of thousands. So it's like, well, mm -hmm. why don't we start renting out some of the space? Mm -hmm. And that's when the cloud was invented. And then all of a sudden, Amazon just started making more and more and more of these huge server plants all over the place, all over the world. And um, that then then they started renting them out as the and they provided a console that the fancy console they developed and then they started renting it out as a service and that's a much cheaper and more efficient way of storing our data than it is to ha house our data in data the storage uh, units out across the UK. That's also much more sustainable from an IT standpoint and from an environmental standpoint as mm. it's using less electricity and stuff like that. So. That's probably another point, but other than that, uh, COVID probably helped the most with us becoming more environmental as mm. it, it, we're not using the offices anymore. People yeah. don't go, people don't drive to the offices anymore. People don't necessarily get on the buses. There's mm. 2000 less people traveling into Leeds on a daily basis to go mm. to work than there was three years ago because COVID made us adapt to a working from home, which we would never have done if that mm. hadn't have happened. So. Yeah, I think we are massively more sustainable than we were five years ago. And I also don't think we were uh, massively environmentally unsustainable at that point. And I think there's much bigger, much more 
concerning corporations than I think any just digital is up towards environmental sustainability, you know, as I mean, a threat anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I know, you know, I know it was embedded into the values of the organization as well. That it, yeah, definitely. You know, it, it's part of their goals. And like you say, the the going paperless thing. And, you know, you we, you raised the only other point that I was going to sort of highlight of like, well, how, how were you getting into work? You know, if you've got all those people not traveling by fossil fuel powered vehicles into work, then that's a big gain, you know, so all that yeah, less obviously. carbon into the sky. The next question is social media. Um, I want to look at this because more and more of us, you know, we call it social media, but for more people now and more and more, it's becoming more of your work, whether you're looking for work, whether you're using an internal social media at work, something like Slack or Teams, or whether you're creating stuff, you know, like even if you're not in the marketing department, you might be called upon to be in a, a social media post or take part in any kind of thing. So for you, in terms of your work, how much time do you need to spend on social media, um, if at all? And if you do spend time on it, can you see the return on investment for the time that you put in? Like, is it immediately obvious to you that, say, I've spent a day or a couple of hours on social media doing this, I put it out, I get the return that I expect, or is it just firing stuff out there? From an NHS digital standpoint, I have i'm on slack active on slack 37 and a half hours a week that and so therefore like from that standpoint i kind of i touch on it to reply to messages but i I mean i kind of i don't even class that as like a social media i kind of just i separate that as kind of like a work messaging tool and Mm -hmm. just um kind of think about it like that but um when it comes to like the use of social media for for other aspects of work like but like side projects and stuff like that and um things which i which i've been interested in it's like i just i just think it's an i think it's an incredibly powerful tool i'd return on investments an interesting one because i haven't personally had what i would class as a positive return on the investment of the time that i've put in mm-hmm. but then again it's it's on what time scale you look at it. So it's, it's like, it's how you class that return on the investments. It's like, mm. but I do to a certain extent, I class the return on the investment. I have, so for example, I've started a couple of events in Leeds. One that my friend was started in Newcastle. He's expanded it and I've started in Leeds for him. And then another one I've started entirely on my own. So there's kind of, there's Leeds dates, which is like kind of like the Newcastle dates, lead states coming all over the place to in Liverpool, got in Bath. And so that is kind of, we started that in Leeds mm-hmm. and then there's Sunday sessions, which we started in Leeds, which is kind of like more of like a, a drinking party kind of event on a Sunday kind of thing. And so with these, so we've not run the events yet. So we're kind of like, we're launching lead states on, um, Valentine's day this year. And, um, Sunday sessions launching in April. So it's like the return on investment side of things. When we're looking at finances, we haven't had a return, but it's like when we're looking at, if I'm judging it based on the, the actual following of the account and the interaction with the accounts, then I'd say there's a massive return on the investment because the time that I've put in has been on developing those accounts, developing yep. those social media profiles yep. to kind of get those, get those two brands out there so they're kind of in the face of the people in Leeds and um and then get that social proof as well yeah just kind of get that social presence and then that and then people have heard of it and then kind of that's the thing and then but the the, these the business plans for these for these events have kind of all been centered around social media as a whole Mm. is kind of like that that's how we hit the target audience that's how we uh, get the ticket sales that's how we get the event heard about mm. and that's how we build the brand you know what i mean and so it's, it's entirely around social media so to a certain extent it's put into everyone's hands a, an opportunity to make some money because you don't have to be the face of your own brand you, you can you can go online make a logo make think of an idea do you know what i mean mm. you can even make a we can make a website on wix in half an hour do you know what i mean mm. so if you want to make a brand and make something then you 
you can go and do it. And and if you want to get a following, you can go out there and you can follow people. They might follow you back. They might not. You know what I mean? Mm. You can post about your stuff. The more you post, there's algorithm out there on the social media that'll put you out there. And if you look into it hard enough and you do it, then you can get a fairly decent following. Then it's entirely down to the product and the bit or the business or the service that's being provided as to whether it'll take off at that point. But mm. the social media platforms provide you with the the basic platform to do all of this stuff and reach that audience that you would have had to pay a load of money to reach previously. Do you know what I mean? So from that, from that to that extent, I just, I love social media because it just means that it, you can try 50 odd business ideas. Mm. I mean, it's never going to be, it's not like the ideal that I'm not telling you, saying, go and try 50 business ideas, <laughs> maybe one at a time, give them a, give them a year <laughs> or so. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And if you're on number 50, then you're not doing it. You need to, you need to yeah, make a, uh, go and speak to somebody. But, um, but yeah, it's, it does give you that opportunity to kind of like, if you want to, you can try something and you can see how it's, how it's taken on by the public out, what people think about it mm. from really, really incredibly easily. Do you know what I mean? So mm. I love it in that, in that kind of aspect. It makes life a, a, exciting in that. It, if you see it from that point of view, I don't mm. really love it for myself. I'm not one of, I, don't, I have personal social medias and I use them now and then, but I honestly don't care about them and I don't mm. really go on them very often mm. uh, anymore. That, that, so only the recently the last few years of that's happened, that's changed. I used to use them all the time, but mm. I really don't go on them anymore that, that often for myself. But mm. on these like kind of like business accounts, I'm on them all the time, like looking the analytics, going on them, kind of like posting, mm. just following people. Do you know what I mean? So met, replying to direct messages, all that kind of stuff. So it does take up a lot of my time in my spare time, mm. but I enjoy it. So I don't see it as a job in that aspect i kind of see it more as like a these are kind of like my little babies and mm. i want to kind of nurture them and see them grow and that that kind of how i kind of look at that kind of work so mm. i kind of enjoy it more than i do see it as so yeah i do see it as an investment though that, that's 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 true because but i see it more and in the future these things it's the kind of like I'm doing them and I'm looking at, it's also more of like, a, I, I really want these to succeed, but mm. they're also kind of like a, a learning curve on, cause this is my first time ever really venturing into marketing sales, anything like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm. And doing all of that. So learning that through these processes and then it's like, it's, if these work, I mean, even if they don't mm. work, it doesn't matter. I still learn things from it, but if they do work, then it's kind of like a, right, well, we know what worked there. Mm. So can we adapt that and maybe provide something which might cost a bit more money? Do you know what I mean? Or, or something which is more widely available. Do you know what I mean? So rather than an event, which is confined to 50 people in Leeds once a week, like a product or a service or a subscription that is available to the entirety of the UK or the whole world. Mm. And you, and that's what I mean. So you can put that out on social media and say it's, it's a fiver and a thousand people buys five grand, didn't it? Do you know what I mean? So it's mm. like, and it's not hard to reach a thousand people anymore. Mm. So it's like, if you have something that's good value, then whether that be a, a, a subscription or anything. So it's like, I think that it's also look into the future. It'd be something that I just want to learn more and more about, you know what I mean? And kind of mm. get better at, because I just think it's a really valuable tool. If you can market something on social media well, then it unlocks a lot of doors. Mm. And I can see, like, you're very good at kind of anticipating things that I would be asking because you, <laughs> there were parts of that where I was like, right, I'm going to ask him this question and then you answered it. But yeah, I, you, you speak to me, it gives me an impression that. Again, there's a line of maybe it's not conscious synergistic thinking, but there's sort of synergistic thinking there and that you've got this development developer background and then sort of playing around with the social media. So like I can see you potentially, or maybe, maybe not anything can happen, but, you know, going down a kind of app route and, or maybe developing something with your marketing side in mind. Is that, is that a possible? Yeah, definitely. I think it's so the, the development thing for me, one thing I've 
learned for over the course of my degree apprenticeship is that I, I really, I'm not a huge fan of working from home. Mm. I. I, I, don't, I don't mind working from home, but it's like, mm. I'm not a huge fan of working from home as a software developer. Mm. It, I find it, it quite isolating and, mm. and there's not enough communication there. And there's not enough interaction. I kind of need that in my, in my, in my life and mm. not to like, but do you know what I mean? So it's like at the moment, in order for me to speak to people who I don't live with, I have to go out of my house to go and do something that, and put myself out there. Whereas. Before I'd naturally speak to you know, like fifty odd people, hundred people. Yeah, you a week. were just at work, yeah. Yeah, and and getting on the bus or yeah. like going to the, going to the gym after after work and stuff like that. Whereas mm. now, it's kind of like I have to go out and put myself out there. So I don't know if that's kind of made driven me to kind of look at these these other aspects because I'm not. I don't know if I, I honestly software development is kind of working from home now. Mm. And I don't know what other jobs in that field, um, I would look at. So it's like, I don't, I don't see myself. I enjoy my job and I can do mm. it working from home. But one of the main things I enjoy about the fact that it's working from home is that it allows me to, to focus on other things as well. Do you know mm. what I mean? So it's mm. like, it doesn't have to become my life. Mm. So I can have other things which I think about and which I focus on and therefore it, but it provides me with a skill, which means that. When, when I think about these other things and then I'm like, so say I did come up with an idea which I wanted to make an app or I wanted to make mm. a website. And by the way, for anybody making a website, if you, as long as it's fairly basic, you just want to put some information out there, you can do it on your own. You don't need mm. to have anybody else to do it. Anybody can do that. It's uh, use Wix, WordPress, anything like that. Um, they all work. Um, yeah, and it can cost you a tenner, but for making an app, yeah, there's um, there's more in, that can go into that. I don't know off the top of my head if there's anything out there which will make you an app that quickly, but um, mm. but I don't know off the top of my head. But I could do that. Do you know what I mean? So that's a skill mm. which I've now developed. Mm. Only to a basic level. I'm not saying I could build a Facebook app in, mm. in, a, in a week, but I could build a basic level app over the course of a period of time yeah. if I thought that it was going to be something which would provide me with a return on the investment do you know what i mean yeah i I mean you have expertise you have spent four plus years doing this you know like yeah you've got experiences and all the different you know the the little off book experiences you just went through a pandemic you know (laughs) it's unique learning Um, yeah no it's one way of putting it yeah (laughs) Yeah, the, I, I've got one more question on that. So, just on the on the kind of promotion front, I'm just intrigued to to kind of put this to you. Do you think you would have got interested in the promotion side had it have been pre social media? You know, like if it was designing posters, printing the posters, and then schlepping around like handing out posters. Like, did the ease of being able to kind of go, oh well, I need to do a piece of graphic work and then we put it on whichever social media and we spread it around within this kind of message. Do you think that was a big draw in, in you getting drawn into kind of being interested in promotion? It's an interesting question. Cause it's like, I don't, I, honestly, I don't think I would have got into it. Had it have been a time where that was the method of promoting a, a product or, or an I or an idea or anything, mm. because well, just because of the sh- of the fact that you would so say, because I mean, are we talking at a time where there's also you're also you're not so, you know social media? Uh, well, I don't know. Let's say, I mean, because I would still put up a poster and hand out flyers. Now I, we do still do that, but yeah, I mean, there the, there was MySpace and stuff, but I mean, even with MySpace being big, like I suppose that's when things started to get. You know, the clever people were on MySpace mm, advertising yeah. their stuff, whereas yeah, yeah, yeah. people were still doing like the traditional method and so on. So then um, I'd say no, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I'd, yeah. I'd like to think I have that entrepreneurial kind of like drive to kind of do it no matter the circumstance. But I think it's honestly how easy it is to do it. Yeah. That's kind of made me think, well, why not? I don't it, know if that would have happened. But it's easy, but it's not easy as well, because it, it's like, 
where you don't have to get all the materials, print the thing, get all the thing, hand out the thing, but you still have to create the thing and then put, get it out there. But it's just, you know, you don't have to do literally the footwork. Yeah. But, 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 um, like for, I, I'm speaking from like my own personal experiences, which have been like, to be honest, it, it is not difficult. So it's like for like, um, an event, for example, a lot of places will allow you to run an event without you, if you will get them to be full on a Wednesday night, mm. they're not going to charge you any money. They'll take the bar money. Mm. But if you, but if you can come up with a decent idea where, well, so you're not got any upfront cost, you can come up with a decent idea. You can find a way of putting that on a social media account and building a following. And you don't mm. have to build a following through promoting it through posters. You can just follow people who are in the age category, in the, the, the domain and the area that you want and follow them and you'll get a return on that. You know what I mean? Some maybe 10% will follow you back. Maybe. 5% will, but yeah. whatever it is, you, mm. you don't have to keep following them. One thing I do, I follow them and I'll go through my people, everyone I follow. It's very tedious, but I'll go through everybody I follow. And if they don't follow me back, I'll unfollow them mm. and I'll look on their followers and I'll see, cause you'll come up at the top of the do. And I will do that for, for 600 accounts on a Thursday night while I'm sat on the sofa doing nothing else. Mm. And, and it's because then somebody will go on my page and they might see, they might think, oh, right, well. At least he's not just done that for that. Do you know what I mean? So I'm just like, and, and I look at that, and, that, and that's just an I. That's just a thing. It maybe that's just me, but I'll think about it, and it'll bug me. And then I so, I'll, so I'll do that sort of stuff. But it's like, and if, and you can do, and you can do it. Do you know what I mean? So it's like anybody can do that. Mm. It doesn't. It does. You don't have to be somebody special. And that's why. I, that's why I like it a lot, to be honest, because mm. you don't. You could be anyone, and it, and it doesn't really matter. And as long as you've got a good idea. It doesn't even have to be a good idea. It could be a very niche idea. If it's your idea of good, then it'll be someone else's idea of good. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And we Leeds especially, they're in a very diverse city. So it's like that you can do anything. If mm. you put on a pottery class in Headingley one, once every month with 50 people, 50 spots, and you were good at pottery and you promoted it properly, you'd get 50 people there. Because they'd turn up. Mm. People would be thinking, oh, I have nothing to do on a random Wednesday. I'll go do some pottery. It's only five quid. Mm. And or, or whatever, do you know what I mean? So it's like, but you've got to market it correctly and stuff like that. I, I'm not saying I'm professional by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I just, I've, I've, I've not it's, had. It's possible, yeah. and you know, you've, you've done it, and it's like, right, th well, this, I can do this, and, and therefore I can do a bit more. I can make it a bit bigger. I can. Yeah, and if you yeah. look on a big scale, and you look at any of your celebrities it's only what they're doing on a smaller scale. So it's like all of mm. your big celebrities, uh, for example, every, everybody, they're, they're all doing it. So like, even, even with podcasting, for example, I know an awful lot of celebrities mm. who like will start a podcast and advertise it through their social media account. You know what mm. I mean? Whatever it be. Every, so every celebrity is doing it these days, like starting a, 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 a company or, or a, a makeup mm. brand or a water bottle or, or mm. something, you know what I mean? And then, and then they're selling it through social media marketing. They're not selling it because they've gone and you, you wouldn't flick ITV on and you've got an ad for Kim Kardashian's makeup. Do you know what I mean? It's not there because she doesn't bother because she knows it's completely ineff ineff ineffective. Yeah. She's not, she's not targeting the market of the people who are watching ITV on a Thursday night. And if she is, she's hitting them while they're watching, while they're scrolling through Instagram on the ad break. Yeah. So she doesn't need to put an ad on because they're on the phone while the ads are on looking at her stuff anyway. Mm. It's like it's just the the marketing side of things has just completely changed. Realistically, the only reason you would ever buy an ad on a television, if you in, in my eyes, is if you were buying a Sunday afternoon ad and you're selling settees that aimed at middle aged sixty like sixty year old elderly people. You know what I mean? Or re retired pensioners? Because that mm. pe pe that's the only people who realistically, in my eyes, still religiously watch TV and get their ideas from ads on TV. And that, that might be incredibly youthful thinking. And I think it might be <laughs> because I'm sure a lot of people do watch TV and I do watch TV, yeah. but I don't pay attention to the ads anymore because I've got a phone and I know a lot of people don't really pay attention to the ads. Mm. Like, um, so I think it's kind of transformed that kind of side of thing. Mm. So, and it's free. It's like you, if you, if you have a presence, you can advertise for free. You don't have to pay for anything. I know all social media provide you with these packages on Instagram and stuff like that, but I think they're absolutely useless if I'm, if I'm being perfectly honest, I don't think that they're worth the paper they're written on. So I think that from that sense, it's probably better to 
kind of try and just do it yourself. Try and find the people that you want, mm. try and get an interaction from them and then see if they interact back. Because if they don't, then that, then you don't want them to anyway, because they, they weren't interested. So it's like, there's no point. But mm. if they, if they followed you back, then, you know, they've actually looked, they've seen mm. it. They've not just thought, oh, this person's followed me. I'll follow them back. Cause mm -hmm. nobody does that. But if they look, they'll have looked at the page and thought, oh, right. That looks like something I could get on board with or something I might want to use or something I might like the look of. And then they've, they followed it back and then you're going to come up on their page. And then if you keep posting, mm. you'll come off their page more often. And then if, yeah, they might think, oh, I'm sick of this guy posting. I'm going to unfollow him. But then again, it's, the, it's another one of them. It's like. If they were never going to be a customer, what's the point following you anyway? So it's like, exactly. so I think, I, I honestly think that it doesn't matter that how big the fan base is or how big the following is, as long as you've got people who are actually interested in the product and want to interact with the product and are actually mm -hmm. like, oh, this guy's posted. I'll like that post because I'm interested in how, where this is going mm -hmm. and following this journey. Then that's all that matters. And, and I think people are becoming a lot more um, supportive of kind of, hustles and people like kind of be like, right, I'm going to try and do this. You know what I mean? I see it all the time with like, I've just come out of university. Well, all of my friends have and everybody at university is starting up a side hustle, starting up a side business and they're making money on it. Do you know what I mean? People are, mm. people are taking that chunk of the GDP, that, that little bit here and there for little things. And it just, it, it creates an idea. Like we're, I feel like there's a, there's a generation of people who are like, like business minded thinkers a lot more than say wanting to go into a specific nine to five. I think people would prefer to, on the whole, a lot of people, a lot of people do get a good return on their investment or if they've wanted to do a job for, for the whole of their life, but it's hard to work out what you want to do in my, in my um, experience anyway, it's like you doing it for a long time. Like I don't know what I want to do and I know that changes and stuff like that, but it, when you're when you're young and you're 18 to 25, it feels like what you are doing is essentially going leading because it's all getting more and more specialist until you get to the age of 22. So it's like you come out at 22 and you've specialised in something. You're like right, I've got to go and get a job in this now because I don't know anything else. And then that, but and that's fine. But it's like what this is also providing is like yeah, do that and let that pay your bills. And then if you want to try and do something else, then there's a platform for you to do that there with essentially no risk. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I think the other thing that you kind of mentioned, you know, when you said about learning the marketing skills and so on, that's a side of work that you would have just been kept so far away from kind of traditionally, because it's not, it's not in your remit at all. It's not what you would be doing. Why would the hell would you need to know anything about marketing? Because you've got that open avenue. So say you do go into business for yourself fully, you, you, you've already got that other, you know, because if you're in business on your own and it's just you, you have to be everything. And you've already got that side of, you know, that skill set that you've already nurtured and developed. What was the other thing that I was going to say on that? Um, yeah. So, uh, and when you were talking there about, you know, essentially looking for your market and looking for those people who are giving the buying signals and, you know, as you're going through finding your followers and focusing down on the followers that you want, that's essentially like, that is what in previously someone would have a big list of phone numbers of people going through, ringing them up for likely candidates. And it would be a matter of, you know, narrowing that down, narrowing that down until you got to the people who would buy, but you're doing that via technology without having to directly engage with those people immediately. So you're exactly. already nation and down it's all done already. Like I'm not, I didn't decide that I wanted to do that. I knew realistically if, so for example, with Leeds dates, if I wanted to sell out an event, which is an 18 to 25 event in Leeds for uh, speed dating, then I need to be having people following me who are ideally single 18 to 25 and living in Leeds in and around, in or around Leeds and 50% male, 50% female if possible. And so I will go through and I'll look at my analytics on my Instagram page for the Leeds State site. And it will tell me that a strong 85% of the following are in, uh, are 18 to 25. And like 47% are boys, 53% are girls, 
and and this is this is this is what they are as well. This is off the top of my head. This, this is exact uh, accurate, but this is around about. Mm. They're they're all eighteen to twenty five near, near near enough, fifty fifty male uh, female, and you've got them all in Leeds. So and and you can so I've got they're all predominantly in the UK and they're all in Leeds. And if the eighty mm. percent are eighteen to twenty five, the other fifteen twenty uh twenty five to to 40 which we also run a we run a 25 plus night so it's like it was hitting the right people as long as they're in leads and it's like the only way that that happens i don't think that happens through an instagram paid ad because i don't think that they necessarily put them out there to the right audiences because i've mm. seen that, that i've seen that done for an account which um, one of my friends had and he was getting no interaction on the page, but he'd got a thousand odd followers after a, after an ad. And I was thinking, mm. what what's uh, the that, that that can't be right? Do you know what I mean? So, mm. but if you want the people to like actually engage, I feel like they've got to click follow because they've they've they they've been followed by you. I look at it. They're, they're the only reason you look at an account is if somebody followed you. And so I honestly think just follow people. I don't think it's a problem. Like people mm. people can just not accept the follow request yeah. or they can they can just not follow you back if anything they yeah. just gained a follower it's not the end of the world do you know what i mean mm. and th there's no harm in doing it and it can grow a brand a lot faster than say anything else i don't know no instagram stops you po like following more than about 150 people a day mm. but that's enough because if I, loads, I'd, yeah yeah, yeah it, 100, <laughs> if you follow 150 10 people days day, you got like thousand yeah. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. You follow a thousand people over the course of a week. Mm. I say honestly, if you, I've, I over the cross. So lead dates gets less retention on the followers. When I follow 150 people, I'd probably say I get about eight or nine follows back mm. on that account because it's obviously you've, you've got to also you look at whether people are single and stuff like that, or even mm. interested in the event. It's, it's a niche thing. Not many people want to go speed dating mm. necessarily. Uh, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like if if you want to do it they'll want to do it. So it's mm. like he gets the followers and it get and it builds the account. But that's the main thing is the people who follow it want to go and do it. And and that's and they they're engaging with it. And that's all that matters because that's what we want because it, it's a fun night for people who want to come and actually let their hair down and enjoy themselves and speak to some new people and kind of put themselves out there. If mm. you're not that kind of person then then that's absolutely fine. No one's forcing you to. And and but with the Sunday sessions, for example, it's much more of an open thing. It's kind of like that's you can come any age it's just a, a nice drink on a sunday afternoon with some good music watching the sun go down through the summer mm. uh, every sunday at a rooftop in leeds mm. so it's kind of like open to a lot more people so i'd say if you follow 150 people on that i think we're getting about more more like 20 follows back mm. can, it's, a, it's like and that's and that's much like that account's growing much quicker mm. but it's because the it's because it's a much more uh it's much less niche as a brand do you know what i mean so it's like uh, but there's different goals with the two things. So you've just got to set out what you want and you've got to be realistic with the expectation. Like you're not going to get, you don't follow 150 people, get 150 followers back. And I kind of knew that. It was a shocker at first, to be honest. I was thinking maybe I thought more people had, had interact. You just got to kind of like build with it. Do you know what I mean? And kind of mm -hmm. just, just let, let, let it do its thing. And mm -hmm. people need, people want to see something grow and I, I think people get behind stuff so i'm having a lot of faith in humanity here but i, I do think um well you're young yet these days yeah. <laughs> uh yeah no I, I i think you're right um yeah uh i'm gonna move on to the next question so if there was a universal basic income if you were being paid enough money to live how do you think that would affect your work would you still be doing what you do now would you be doing something different and if you'd still be doing what you do now, would you be doing it as much or less? Or how would how would things change for you, do you think? I would do something that I enjoyed a bit more, I think, because I one of the fundamental reasons why I went into this job was because it had a good um pay progression. Do you know what I mean? Over the, mm. there was a good return on my investment with my work. So that was the main one of the main reasons why I went into it. I was looking at I'm going to do. They're going to pay for me to do a degree, so I'm not mm -hmm. going to take on any lending for that. And mm -hmm. I get a good salary increase over the course of these four years, and mm -hmm. I'm coming out on it on a good salary with good experience mm -hmm. and a degree. So I was like, 
that was why I did this. Mm. But if there was um, a universal basic income, I think I would, I would definitely be in a more interactive work environment. Mm. And I'd, I'd look for something that I've, I'd look for something I thoroughly enjoyed, you know what I mean? I'd look for something that I wanted to do when I woke up in the morning. And I'm not saying I don't, it's my job at the moment, mm-hmm. but there's more days than I would like where I'm like, oh, gosh, I wish I had another hour in bed. But, um, that, but, and I know people who really love their job and I would drive, I would, um, I would have a drive to be that person in that case and i do as i do at the moment as well but i have a certain level of sacrifice i'm willing to make mm. for a little bit of extra money here and there do you know what i mean mm. it's it is well it's also uh, if there was a universal basic income there wouldn't everything else wouldn't be trying to take all of you do you know what i mean everything would yeah. be cheaper yeah. so it, so it would be a much more I wouldn't need to necessarily, and it wouldn't be the, it'd just be a completely different world, wouldn't it? So it's like, mm. I, it wouldn't necessarily be my priority. Priorities would be completely different. My mm. priorities would change. And, um, I think that's just something which is hard to kind of think about what would be my priority in that circumstance, because yeah, I've never thought about it really. Yeah. I was going to say to you, cause you, you know, immediately with the, the answer on, on the apprenticeship, I, I mean, say there was a ubi before that and you know given that the reasons you know you had thought out practical reasons for going down the nhs digital route like if there was a ubi potentially you might have just been like well i don't know (laughs) you know i mean maybe you'd have been yeah maybe you'd have been you'd have got into the promoting and stuff but potentially you could have been kicking your heels for three years going i don't know what i want to do so like on to some degree, perhaps, you know, you, you were driven in a more focused way into that because of the situation that we, we do have, I don't know. I think, but it, it, it does open interesting doors. It doesn't, it's, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to kind of, um, comprehend. Do you know what I mean? Cause it's, mm. it's kind of like one of those things that it's it's like well i honestly and this might be this makes me think that all of my decisions have been based upon financial income <laughs> since i was 18 but then i think a lot of them have been heavily driven towards being kind of comfortable because or secure you yeah, know, like, yeah. I, I don't want to be destitute <laughs> like, yeah exactly yeah no to definitely 100 percent and, um, and I, I honestly, I honestly don't know. I think it would, it would come to, it would come down to, um, finding something I enjoyed. And I think at 18 years old, mm. I would have struggled to find that, mm. but I also think potentially I would have just gone to uni. Do you know what I mean? I would have just picked something and gone to uni cause I'd have been like, well, yeah. Let's see if I enjoy it. And I'm sure it wouldn't have been, it w- well, like I say, there wouldn't have been an, an enormous pressure on that being the right decision mm. because if there was a UBI, I would come out of it and uh, everybody would have the same loans, pay on the same amount of income. So it wouldn't necessarily be an issue. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. I, and I, and yeah, so I think it's just a, it's a difficult thing to think about. Well, and potentially you could have stayed on in education as well. Like you might have done a degree and then gone, hmm, I want to do my master's, you know, like. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I, before I was doing this, when I did ask people about a UBI, or when I did ask people if money was no issue, the most common answers I got were people would either go back to school, uh, so they do more more learning, or travel. And, uh, and, and I find it interesting that nobody on this as I've asked, nobody said either of those so far. Um, but yeah, I, I, so the other question, the other part, do you think, or do you know that you would still work? Like, would you want to work or would you want to like kick back? Cause I imagine you've not actually had like, cause even when you study, you were studying with a job. So you didn't even have, get to have the student experience of, you know, a couple of lectures and then not doing much for yeah. a few hours. Like, 
have you had any proper downtime? Would you like downtime? Are you quite, do you know if you're quite a workaholic person or like, what's your sense of, of how you work at the moment? Um, well, I'd say uh, it depends how you cost downtime. So my downtime, I'd say I have, my, I spend a lot of time sat down <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> like I am at a desk an awful lot of the time. And, um, from that aspect, I would not want to do that. Mm. Uh, but my, like, as in my, my, I have a, my head doesn't like to not have anything to think about. I need mm. like something to be kind of stimulating me on a, on a daily basis, mm. almost something to be a little bit stressed about. Not, not mm -hmm. incredibly, but just a little bit, just to mm. kind of keep me ticking mm. and, um, and so from that aspect, I couldn't sit around and do nothing. Mm. Like the, honestly, the, the thought of that would, I, I wouldn't want to do it. The thought of that is mm. horrible, mm. but I, I would, so then I would need something to keep me busy. Even if that was, you know, I had a workshop and I, I built stuff and that, that would be probably be enough if I had not so a couple of nice mates who were doing it with me. And mm. to be honest, so that's an interesting question because I also didn't even think about the fact that maybe I wouldn't even have to work. Do you know what I mean? Like that you wasn't did. something which I even considered. I was <laughs> like, I, can't. I was more thinking, well, I can do any job. I was yeah, like, yeah. But, but having no job was like, oh, well, <laughs> maybe. But I also think <laughs> with be, being like young, like I would say, I would want, I do, I have a drive to go traveling. I do want to go and travel and see as much as possible. I, I Yeah, I, I think that's great. I think if you can do it, then do it. But mm -hmm. Yeah, like at the moment, it's incredibly expensive. It's not easy to just do that. And uh, obviously, I have a job, so I can I can only do it for six weeks of the year. Mm. And not like I say, yeah, it can be cheap to go to these places if you go and spend six months there, and then you travel and see the, see it all in six months. But if you're taking to and from flights once every yeah. two weeks, and doing it two weeks at a time, it becomes incredibly expensive, doesn't it? When mm. you're paying thousands of pounds on flights, so it's like mm. that. Doesn't is also something which I've kind of seen as. Like I have to pick a time to go traveling when it's most, um, it's most beneficial to mm. my career and stuff like up until this point, I couldn't have done cause I'm doing a degree. And if I left up until this point, they, I wouldn't have finished it and mm. it's being paid for. So I couldn't have done. Mm. So I've managed to get to 23 and not, um, not have an opportunity to go traveling, but now I'm getting to a point where, yes, I could leave my job and do that, but I'm mm. thinking, is it the right time? Um, is it the right time to be coming back to the country to look for a job? Like I know, I'd, I know, yeah. I'd, I know, I would potentially, I'd hope to be able to find one in software development as it's fairly high demand. But yeah, it's whether I find one know. I wanted, and yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, and, and I quite, I quite like my job. Worked here a while, mm. and so when I, when I tell a lot of people this, they're astounded that I have. I'm at 23 years old, thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to like potentially go traveling because I like my job. It's like, it's not because I like my job. It's more because yeah. I feel secure in my job. And yeah. I, even though I'm 23, I have quite a lot of like bills, you know what I mean? So I have, I have things, I have a mortgage, I have these things, which I have to pay. And mm -hmm. therefore the idea of not having a job scares me a little bit and not have it. And that's why I'm setting up all these side hustles. Cause for a 23 year old, I've actually kind of like woken up to the fact that you actually do need a financial income every single month or you are screwed mm -hmm. to put it in a bad way, but, um, you are, and that, that's the fundamentals of it. You need the money coming in every month to pay the bills. Otherwise if one month it doesn't come, then you, you're in a bit of a sticky wicket. So kind of, I've kind of looked at that and I've been like, right, well, how much do I essentially get a month in my bank after? all this stuff how can i get that coming in from other things it's like well if i can get one event that sells 30 tickets a tenner a ticket that's 300 quid and if that goes on twice a week or if that goes on once twice a month then that's 600 quid a month coming from that event can we start another one mm. oh well, then then do you know what i mean and then if you get to the point where yeah you can get say i don't know a few grand coming in from that then you can get to the point where you're like oh right well if i do want to stop my job then luckily I'm, I'm all right. I'm renting my flat out. I get a little bit of profit from that every month. So it's like, mm. and eventually you get those little side incomes, which make you think, oh, finally, I don't have to do this job anymore. 
Mm. And it's like, and then the day that that, the day that my side money coming in is more than the money coming in for my job is the day where I'll actually think, you know, I can actually go traveling because mm. I don't want to be going traveling thinking I'm coming back and I'm going to be broke and nothing coming in. So it's like, I don't, I, that, that, the idea of that scares me, but I do want to do it all. And mm. so, yeah, if there was a UBI, I would probably do a bit of traveling as well. Mm. And I think I'd prioritize a lot of other things, but w- whether that would be something which you could just do, do you know what I mean? I don't, because mm. otherwise, otherwise I'm sure everyone would do it, but I, I'm sure that wouldn't be universe. I don't know, actually, but I never even thought about it, but. Well, the, well this is the thing we kind of, there's, there's a lot of assumptions built into things. And so I'll give you a random example. So I was, I've been listening to this, um, do you know, Kathy Burke? Have you heard of Kathy Burke? I haven't, no. Right, yeah. So, do you know Harry Enfield? Yes, I do. Okay, so she, like Kevin and Perry, she was the one mm-hmm. one of them. Oh, really? Uh, so, actress from 80s, 90s. She's got a podcast at the moment. She's in, the, you know, she's in her 60s now. And um, she's doing this podcast for, you know, one of these other, like, interviewing celebrities things. But the the topic's like death, so it's sort of how your death would be. And, you know, who speaks about their thoughts about their funeral or, you know, like mm-hmm. how things would be or how they imagine it to be. And it's kind of, you have these conversations with yourself in your head and then you say them out loud. <laughs> it's like, you know, so she's talking to various people and then they're talking about things. Yeah. And they're, they're obviously thoughts they've had in their head that they've been mulling over. And then it's like, hmm, parts of that don't seem so reasonable now I say it. And, you know, you, and you don't always know what you think until someone asks you either of like, you think I, I, I know there's loads of stuff where I'm like, I think I have an opinion on this. And then someone asks me and I'm like, oh, I don't really know actually. But yeah, I just think that's interesting. No, it is. It, yeah, definitely. Like it, especially with this topic, because with like the, 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 like if money wasn't a thing and uh, so it was like, we were all on a level playing field. It was kind of like everybody was in the same situation. Then it's, it's one of those where it's like, you, you don't know because it's a what it, you don't know how far it could go on. Do you know what I mean? Cause it's mm. like, well, yeah. Cause he, I just sat there and thought, well, couldn't, well, surely everyone would go traveling. Mm. And I thought, well, well. They probably could have, couldn't they? But then I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe they couldn't actually because somebody has to fly the plane. And then I'm thinking, oh, somebody has to <laughs> put the luggage on the plane. So I'm thinking, well, they couldn't be going traveling. So it's, it's a hard thing to think about. So there'd have to be some way that, that there's a lot of logistics. You've got to kind of think of it from a high level, haven't you? Because you don't know how it'll pan out because there'd be a yeah. lot of planning in it. Yeah. Well, um, but but yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Cause it but not everyone always wants to do the same thing at the same time. And plus, no, that's you what know, I mean. You, you, you know, I've done things like I've done travel and I've gone away and I've got to points where I've been traveling. And I'm like, I'm sick of this. I need to go home. And then, you know, there's, there's aspects of when you go somewhere and when you come back and that would probably be changed by it because, you know, you, you sort of get a travel come down coming back into the UK. It's like, Oh, I've been somewhere hot and sunny all the time. And now I've come back to mm. rainy Britain and now I have to get a job and pay tax. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, Oh, that's a real bummer. <laughs> but if you had a UBI and you come yeah. back and it's kind of like, oh, well, uh, I, I will get a job eventually or I might go away again. Yeah. So many variables. No, it is. That's incredibly interesting. And um, I've never even thought about it in that, in, to that extent. Like it's, it's really interesting because you honestly don't know because it's like, I have not, like you say, not everybody would want to do everything at the same time. Like I'm living in a world where I'm thinking, I'm assuming everybody's, going to take the 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 nice and easy route but not a lot of i'm sure a lot of people probably wouldn't you know what i mean it's mm. like and how long does do you, you say every that you always come home don't you do you know what i mean mm. most people so it's like they, you go tra- how long do you go traveling for mm. how how do you do you enjoy it forever it's like people every good is good come back you get bored so mm. it's like yeah, you might go through an initial period where everybody's on a plane and then going, and you've got more people on the beach in Thailand than you have in London. But <laughs> but then you'd probably get to a stage where everyone's bored and no one's going there anymore because mm. everyone's been. Mm. Everyone's had that chance to go. Mm. That wasn't the case before. So it's not a niche anymore. It's now an, it's now a, a known norm. 
and mm. therefore it's not as exciting as it was before. So then people just get on with it. Do you know what I mean? And then we're like, oh, well, maybe we will want to go there once sometime in the mm. future again when mm. it's exciting to us again. And places might just become a bit more like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I haven't really thought about it. No, well, I'm glad for that. Like, it's been a while since I've, I've asked someone a question and then it's like, oh, that's opened up a whole bunch of doors for me. Yeah, no, no, so that's a great so reaction. Start arguing with myself in my own head while I was trying to answer it. <laughs> okay, I've got another juicy one for you then. So if you could change any three things about your work right now, so you can go as crazy or as like minuscule as you want, like you don't have to change anything if you don't want to. But yeah, so you could change any three things about your work right now. What would they be? So I would most definitely change the fact that we work from home five days a week. Mm. I would much prefer a scenario where I worked in an office with my team members and we were all there collaboratively working together for uh, even if a couple of days a week. I, I was going to say, would you want the full five, di- five days or what, what would be the best well, balance for you? I think back to when I was in the office four days a week and mm. I loved my day at home. Mm. And I was like, I could have done that two days a week. Mm. I think any more than two or three days a week at home. I don't. I wouldn't want to be going in for one day. I, th- yeah, I think yeah, if I went yeah. in for two or three days, I'd be happy. Yeah. And that would be my ideal because I'd have that connect with the people. I'd have that kind of feeling of moral obligation. Like I was letting somebody down, a physical person down. I might see the end users of my product. I might have some visibility of like mm-hmm. start to finish of what things are going on. Because mm-hmm. that's something, yeah, you uh, you develop an awful lot of technology which you don't see used and you don't see the benefits like i know there are a lot of these systems are saving a lot of lives and stuff like that but you don't see it and you never get to hear from these people who use them it's too abstract and especially when you're isolated somewhere it's kind of like i'm just doing stuff yeah exactly (laughs) what is the result of the stuff that i'm doing is it it affecting anything it, it, and, it, and it can become difficult. It's like, it's really uh, difficult because you need yeah. to see the results of your work. You're like, you need to see that what you're doing is doing something that it's effective, that it's, you know, it, yeah, it matters to someone. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And it has no, no, a material impact. A hundred percent, because it's yeah. that. That's the main reason why you you a lot like you get out of bed in the morning. You don't want the bare minimum of getting out of bed in the morning to get paid. You want to get out of bed in the morning because there's some reason of what you're doing is doing something good or mm. doing something which is needed. Mm. And that that's like, it's kind of always been a thing, isn't it? It's like, it's that sense of moral importance. It's like, if you don't feel important and you feel like what you're doing is important, then you become incredibly unmotivated to do what you're doing. Mm. And it's like that with anything. It's like, if mm. you, look at and that that's also a mentality so i'm not saying if you don't think if your job your job could be full, fundamentally un- unimportant and everybody could think it's unimportant but as long as you've got a drive to do it and you know that you have to do it mm. then then that you can develop your own sense of importance you know what i mean yeah but yeah. to an extent it would it is nice to feel like that the, like there's something you get out of, somebody's getting something out of what you're putting in yeah and yeah. no matter what to extent that is, it could be that I get a lot out of the fact that when I'm putting a lemon on the scale at Asda and it won't weigh the lemon, right? And the guy comes over and puts his code in and I can put the lemon down and, and I can pay for my stuff without it telling me that the weight's wrong. Mm. That guy's sort me out, you know what I mean? And he mm. gets a sense of accomplishment. It doesn't have to be anything major, mm. but as long as you can see that you are actually required, mm. that's the main thing. Mm. Whereas yeah it can you can easily get lost in lost in the kind of the big machine of whatever it is that you're working on and that that doesn't matter what you're doing you even the software developer or whether you're it is it is more in the bigger things though isn't it the bigger corporations and stuff like that if you become like you're an engineer or something like this yeah anything you can become moving part and sometimes it's nice to be able to sit back and look at actually yeah i'm not moving part Mm. this this is directly impacting this person or mm. these people or mm. this service that's doing something good or even yeah yeah do you know what i mean it's Just such a huge something. part of it yeah um so yeah so having some office time and then i would also say 
I would like a bit more of um I'd say I can't say say I can't criticize the diversity of my work because I do get mm. to change projects. There's a lot of work that goes on within NHS Digital doing different stuff. And I kind of I can mm. say if I wanted to do some front end development, I would go and do that. If I want to do some back end development, I would go and do that. If I want to work mm. on some cloud technologies, I could do that kind of stuff. So I can't criticize that, that side of things. I think I'm able to work on whatever I want to do. My workload, I can't really say I'd change. I think if more money, better progression, I'd, beautiful offices. I would, <laughs> I would so, so, yeah, I would, I would potentially say better, better progression because, um, I've, I've had good progression because mm. I had a good progression, which was tied into my apprenticeship scheme. Mm. I came off my, I finished my apprenticeship scheme, finished that progression. And then it's kind of like right now it's not in your contract that you go to this next level. Mm. You have to apply for that position mm -hmm. and that position isn't available anywhere. So it's like, it's hard to, it's like, I have to now I'm in charge of my own progression. It's like I have mm. to apply for positions that are better than mine mm. and they might not be available. And like, there's a lot of redundancies at the moment. Like, mm. we're, um, like there's a like a there, there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Like, I really know what how much I'm even allowed to talk about. But there's a lot, yeah, kind of of like uh, there's a big transformation going on. NHS Digital is combining with NHS England. Mm -hmm. So there's the two the two directors are kind of combining into one, and we're losing like thirty five percent of our staff. Mm -hmm. So it's like I don't kind of fall into that. As a tr as still kind of being classed as a trainee and developers being in a high demand um, mm. trade or a specialty, sorry, it still is kind of like I would probably prefer to work in a place, or I would prefer it if the kind of overarching fear of getting sacked wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? Or, or yeah. losing the job like that? Like, it'd be nicer because even though I can sit back and kind of like chill out about my life, it's nice if everybody's doing that rather than. Working yeah. in a team where there's a sense of kind of everyone was a little bit tense. I think that's interesting that you say that as well. That because I've been in workplaces that have been through that, and and when it's happening, it like it is just an awful atmosphere. But that must be weird because you know the fact that you can still feel that being remote. Yeah. No. Well, it's kind of like we. I mean, it, it, I'm, it's I'm sort of there in the back kind of thing of like hmm, people might be losing their jobs yeah it's like so to today like it's just because like we've had a lot of kind of it's mentioned it's kind mm. of i feel like you hear it a lot more because we're at home right because yeah, it's yeah. like people are kind of like stressed and want to know more detail yeah. and therefore bringing it up more often because mm. You don't hear, you hear detail in like small chunks every now and then where they'll mm. be like, right, we'll do a meeting for everybody and a thousand people will join a meeting for an hour and they'll give you a bit of information and you'll then leave it and there'll be loads more questions and they'll have to mm. wait two months for another one of them like that. And so it can be a bit, it's, everyone's talking about it because everybody's stressed. So it's like, mm. you do feel it a lot more at home because when you're in the office, people will just go and chat and stuff like that. and. Mm. Uh, it wouldn't, they wouldn't bring it up in a meeting because mm. they wouldn't have to, because they could bring it up to somebody else and it would be spoken about. And it, we, we would know it. There's always that atmosphere. I've been through it before. There's, mm. there's been this a reorganization mm. a couple of years ago. So it's like, um, it is a tense kind of period of time. And mm. there's like, understandably, like, like a, a reduced kind of workload and stuff like that. And kind of like capacity is like, people to take annual leave and stuff like that in these kind of times stuff like that but um it's just yeah it's just that's something i'd definitely change because it's a it's a stressful environment because you eat like it you just don't it can't be nice and if you put yourself in somebody else's shoes you know what i mean mm. it isn't easy is it i just find it very frustrating because it's like i just think that the way it's handled it's not it's handled well but it is it's not at the same time do you know what i mean because it's like mm. how can you ever handle something like that well it's like yeah exactly yeah. it's hard so yeah. you can't you can't criticize anything because you can't put yourself in the shoes of the people who are doing it because i'm sure it's not their decision i'm sure they've woken up and been like right we have to get rid of 35 percent yeah. of the staff board. I'm sure it's funding and that comes down to 
like government funding, isn't it? And that mm. means it's like we don't have enough money. So mm. there's there's some some reason for that. It's being spent somewhere else. Mm. But then it's it's like in that sense, it just because you know the seventy five percent of the staff. I'm going to know some people. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's a, it's it, a large it's, percentage. It's kind of like over even if that's what I mean. So it's like if it's not if it's not you, you know a couple of people and, and you feel for them because it's a difficult time. I mean, even if you take a voluntary, you know what I mean? And mm. and you, you have that kind of period. It's still, it's not what anybody wants. It's nobody's mm. ideal. When people kind of look at, look at things like voluntaries and then they think, oh, that must've been like, a what a win. And it's like, well, not necessarily if you enjoy mm. your job, you know what I mean? So it's like, mm. and these are things that that's something I'd definitely change. And then probably thirdly, I probably I'll first I'd like a stand up desk to be honest if because uh, I don't like sitting down for several and a half hours a day because it's uh, it's making my back age quite quickly. I so, I would seriously like that last one. Do it like press them for it. I spent seventy quid on a riser for this for where I'm sat. Um, really? Yeah, and it was worth every penny. Like because oh. I. I sat in office chairs for years. I mm-hmm. totally knackered my back from it. Like, I didn't exercise. I should have exercised more. Yeah, like, I'm the same. But the thing is, you know, if you're not, you're not, and you're just sitting in those chairs. So, yeah, get the get the, uh, get the the riser if you can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, do. I think that's a really good, that's a great response. And I second <laughs> your motion. <laughs> so that, that's all my questions. So I'm going to throw it over to you. Um, so I, I suppose if, yeah, basically if there's anything that we missed that you want to talk about or anything that you want to revisit, um, this is your time. And if you want to promote anything, for example, the things you're promoting, um, yeah, you can throw the socials in here as well. So over to you, anything that you want to say? Um, yeah, no, um, I mean, not got an awful lot to add, like I've mentioned, obviously, previously, um, there's a, a couple of events which uh, we've got coming up. We've got uh, the Valentine's Day event for Leeds Dates. If you, if you can find us on Instagram, that's uh, LDS underscore dates for that one. Um, and tickets are going live in the next week for our Valentine's Day event. How much? Uh, they are seven ninety nine speed dating tickets. Bargain. Yeah, there we go. So uh, you can get those at the fixture link in our bio. And then if you want to check out Sunday Sessions events, uh, as it is spelt on Instagram, uh, that's launching in April. And that's uh, going to be a nice Ibiza-style sunset party on a rooftop bar in Leeds. Yet to be announced. Thank you again to Benji for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests. And thanks to you, Lisa, for being my subject. And of course, most of all, thank you to you, my dear listener. I still desperately need at least 10 more people to record as soon as possible. So do take the plunge and get your working hours interview recorded now. The sooner the better. We might not be here tomorrow. Well, we probably will just, you know, wake up to more of the same. But, you know, anything is possible now. We had three prime ministers last year. You can follow the show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Lead. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. DM me with your questions or most importantly to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Not destroying your brain with social media? Then send me an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com or if you'd like to be anonymous, email me at westernstudios at protonmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to share it with your networks. Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help Working Hours grow. Go to Kofi, that's K-O-F-I dot com forward slash Working Hours and join me there for £3 a month and or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash Working Hours Pod to support Working Hours from as little as a pound a month. There's also an Outlander tier for non loiners at £5 a month and a £12 a month big time tier for anyone who feels flash. I'm not really offering anything much on the Patreon yet, as I'm already doing more than enough unpaid labour on this project. If and when things pick up, then we'll see. 
The goal is to make the podcast and my commitment to it both possible and sustainable. If you are happy to make a regular contribution, but you're priced out by a pound a month, you can go to librapay.com, that's L-I-B-E-R-A-P-A-Y dot com forward slash Western Studios forward slash donate and donate from as low as a penny a week all the way up to £89 a week. And people say I'm pessimistic. Again, you can also make one-off donations through LibrePay, which you can do either publicly or anonymously. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. Okay, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore leads. And on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios or go to western hyphen studios.com. <laughs>